Hi, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Today's presentation is Eat Better at School, Creating a Healthier School Food Culture. My name is Carol Muller, and I am the State Director of Action for Healthy Kids in Colorado, and I will be one of your presenters today. Uh, before we get started and I introduce our other presenters, uh, let's go over some logistics. Once you're linked in, you should be seeing a control panel that's usually on the right-hand side of your screen. And you can use your telephone or your speakers to listen to the presentation. Uh, but we do have everybody muted, so uh, we don't hear dogs barking and avoiding static and any kind of background interference. You'll see a dialog box at the bottom of your control panel. You can type questions there into the dialog box as we're going along. And we'll try as hard as we can to get them answered later in the presentation. Uh, if that doesn't work and we run out of time, though, we will uh, shoot you an answer via email following the webinar. This webinar is being recorded. Uh, we will send you a link to the recording and uh, any resources about two to three business days after the webinar. So uh, let's get started. First, I want to give you just a little bit of background information on Action for Healthy Kids in case this is the first time that you've joined us. We are a national nonprofit. We fight childhood obesity, undernourishment, and physical inactivity by helping schools become healthier places. We're a network of parents, of students, educators, community leaders, and health professionals. And we've all come together to create healthier learning environments for our kids. We really feel that everybody has a part to play in ending uh, the nation's childhood obesity epidemic. And we have lots of resources and programs to help make that possible. Our goal is to uh, really create school communities where children learn how to make healthy choices from the minute they, they walk in that front door of the school to the minute they leave at the end of the school day, and then beyond as well. We offer free programs, educational resources, and grants to schools to implement best practices and policies to increase physical activity and to improve the school food environment. Uh, those are our two focus areas. So Game On is our flagship program. And it's designed as a multi-year program framework to help K through 12 schools practice good nutrition and physical activity habits. Uh, Game On is online. There's no cost at all for schools to use it. And it can be tailored to meet your community's specific needs and resources. It's organized into six steps, which you can see there on the right side of the screen. Uh, and it's designed to guide your school in creating a sound, sustainable school wellness framework. In step four, you'll find over 80 nutrition and physical activity challenges with templates and resources and implementation ideas. And many of the action ideas that we'll talk about today during the webinar can be found in Step 4 in Game On. So as I said, my name is Carol Muller, and I'm the State Director of uh, Action for Healthy Kids in Colorado. Uh, also joining me today as a presenter is Michelle Smith. She is our State Coordinator in Texas. And then later on in the presentation, we will um, are very pleased to have with us Robin Johnson uh, from Colorado's Action for Healthy Kids uh, Parent Advisory Board. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about Robin and her, week, her work later when we uh, get to her part. So today we're going to be talking about the school food culture outside of the cafeteria. Uh, so what is a healthy school food culture? What does that mean and what are the benefits? Uh, we'll also review the federal regulations that cover school food outside of school meal programs. And then we'll get into specific topic areas and review best practices and action ideas related to the school food environment. We'll also talk a little bit about sustaining your efforts year after year. And we'll show you some useful resources. So one thing we'd like to point out from the start about this topic. Uh, everybody really feels differently about food. Uh, food is a very emotional subject, and we need to be really sensitive about that whenever we're talking about it with people in our school community. We don't want to be the food police, because that's generally not going to uh, get us the support that we need. But we want to approach the subject by providing easy alternatives and solutions. Uh, pointing out the benefits, like the ones you see on the screen, that's really a great way to get buy-in, and it's really important. Uh, so what are those benefits? A healthy school food culture supports classroom lessons. Uh, food policies and practices reflect those classroom standards and those curriculum standards for health and nutrition rather than conflict with them. A uh, healthy school food culture encourages consumption of nutrient-rich foods. It contributes to good health. 
and it publicly demonstrates the school's commitment to promoting healthy behaviors among its students, its families, and its staff. It sends the message that health is health the top priority. And it can create excitement about nutrition. When nutritious foods are presented in a fun and engaging way, students really are, are a lot more eager to get involved. But of course, the biggest benefit, healthy kids learn better. Uh, you need to tell people about the connection between learning and health. And this is really important because it relates directly to your school's mission. Uh, you want to let others know that increased physical activity and Im improved nutrition have been shown in study after study to increase student achievement. Uh, we have a great resource at Action for Healthy Kids. It's called the Learning Connection. Uh, and this can help you to make the connection between physical activity, healthy eating, and learning. It's a special report. It's easy to read. It summarizes the most recent research proving that healthy kids are better learners. Uh, so we encourage you to download that and share it with your school community. So uh, the school food culture really does go way beyond the cafeteria. It's in the classroom. It's at school events, even in the front office. It includes fundraisers and food sales, birthdays and other classroom celebrations, and uh, school-wide family events. It includes snack programs and, and how we reward our students. Um, access to drinking water uh, is another area. And it, it also includes activities that educate students and families and that promote good nutrition. So we can't cover all of these things comprehensively uh, in this webinar, but we will give you a foundation and some resources you can use to find out more information. So working on the school food culture outside of the cafeteria can really reap benefits in the cafeteria, too. We've heard a lot of cafeteria managers and food service directors remark that you know, parents and, and um, other school staff complain about school meals, but what are they bringing into the classroom? You know, they may be bringing food uh, into the classroom and for school events that, that are a lot less healthy than what you find in the, in the lunchroom. So whether you're a teacher, a student, or a parent, you'll, you'll really have a stronger platform to stand on if you're taking responsibility for those areas that you can control or influence. One way to get started is to take a look around your school. Is your school environment consistent with what your children are learning in class? So we're going to review some common school customs and the messages that these might be sending to our students. Uh, does your school reward students in a healthy way with certificates, small toys, or extra recess time? Or do you use fast food coupons, popsicles, and candy? So look at this example. Uh, fitness winners are rewarded with a donut party. Uh, what kind of message are those student athletes receiving? Uh, oh, come on, it's just a mint. Now, I have heard that countless times, and I bet you have too. Uh, over the course of the school year, that adds up to over three cups of additional sugar and 3,600 extra calories. And we know it's never just one mint a day. Kids get candy everywhere they go these days. So let's talk about school celebrations. In class, students learn about nutrition, healthy eating, and the importance of moderation. But then in some classrooms, uh, they might eat birthday treats over 25 times each year uh, in addition to their holiday parties. Uh, a study revealed that kids can eat as many as one-third of all the calories they need in a day at a typical half-hour birthday party. And what about fundraisers? They support sports, music, art, technology, and, and lots of really important school activities. But what are they promoting? So look at these examples on the slide. Uh, school fundraisers, can, they can promote healthy living, uh, or they can do just the opposite. And then what about your family events? Here are some common themes. Uh, you've got your school carnival, uh, donuts with dads, muffins with mom. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing some of these look familiar to you. So how? How are our kids really going to know what we value when we say one thing in the classroom and then we're, we're creating a different type of school food environment? These messages really can be kind of confusing for our kids. So a healthy school food culture is one in which policies and practices consistently make the healthy choice the easy and desirable one, including outside the school day and during special events. Uh, it's where staff and parent volunteers role model healthy eating habits, and it's where students receive those consistent messages about healthy eating across all aspects of the school. So let's move to uh, regulations. How is the school food culture 
regulated. Uh, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010 was a major step forward in our nation's effort to provide all children with healthy food in school. It created stricter rules for the nutritional quality of meals served through school lunch programs and school breakfast programs. Uh, and it also authorized the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture to set national nutritional standards for all foods sold on campus throughout the school day outside of those meal programs. And that includes vending machines, a la carte lines in the cafeteria, school stores, and fundraisers. Uh, sometimes you'll hear these types of things called competitive foods because uh, they compete with school meals for student dollars. So the new rules that were created by USDA uh, were referred to as Smart Snacks in School, or the Smart Snacks in School rule. <clears throat> they went into effect during uh, the school year 2014-15, although they weren't actually finalized until July of this year. And it's not clear if they will remain intact as is, because Congress hasn't yet, <clears throat> excuse me, Congress hasn't yet reauthorized any of those child nutrition programs. Uh, they were due for reauthorization in 2015, but they continue to be discussed by policymakers, and um, that may be ongoing for a while. So until they're actually reauthorized, though, the standards do re remain in effect um, as they uh, were finalized uh, the, just this past summer. So what do they cover? Uh, Smart Snacks cover all foods and beverages sold to students on the school campus outside of breakfast and lunch, and uh, they cover things sold the entire school day, and that is defined as midnight before to 30 minutes after the end of the school day. Uh, they don't cover foods that are served or shared, like celebrations or rewards, uh, classroom uh, snacks, that type of thing. They don't cover fundraisers where, that are intended, uh, where the food is not intended to be consumed right away, uh, like butter braids, cookie dough, that type of thing where uh, they intended to be consumed at home. Uh, they also don't cover evening, weekend, or community events, uh, concessions at um, evening or weekend athletic events, for example, uh, would not be covered. So uh, foods and beverages sold as fundraisers during the school day that are intended to be eaten right on the spot, so these are definitely subject to the Smart Snacks Nutrition Standards. Uh, now state agencies can set a number of infrequent food or beverage fundraisers that are exempt from these standards if they choose. And uh, the idea behind this was that it would allow schools to keep a limited number of traditional events that they've had around for a while that they consider to be an important part of their culture. So as I said, different states, uh, state uh, Department of Education will determine how many exemptions they're going to allow for their school. For example, uh, Colorado allows three exempt fundraisers per school year for school building. And note that there aren't any limits at all on foods and beverages sold as fundraisers that meet the standards. Uh, also, there are no limits on non-food fundraising and uh, no limits on food fundraisers that are not sold for immediate consumption, like those butter braids and cookie dough, candy bars, that type of thing. So to meet smart snack standards, foods need to be a whole grain, fruit, vegetable, protein, dairy food, or a combination that includes a fruit or vegetable. Uh, they also have to meet specific limits on calories, fat, sugar, and salt. Uh, beverages include water, certain kinds of milk, and 100% fruit juice. But around these things, there are also requirements around portion sizes. And um, it's important if you want to understand you know, in detail uh, what, uh, what the guidelines uh, say, you really should visit the USDA's website for detailed information. And note that <clears throat> smart snacks are a minimum uh, nutrition standard. Uh, some states have put additional requirements in place. Uh, for example, Colorado has a beverage law that's stricter and a policy also that regulates when competitive foods can be sold. So uh, it's important that you check your own State Department of Education and know uh, if there are any uh, stricter standards that would apply. Uh, the USDA has lots of excellent resources, including an implementation guide that was established uh, in July, last July when the rules were finalized. Uh, the Alliance for a Healthier Generation also has some great tools that you can use to see if the food items you want to sell or serve uh, meet the guidelines, or even to browse for snacks, snack products that are compliant. And again, if your state has standards that are stricter, uh, these tools 
may not be appropriate for you to use as they only take the federal standards into account. So your district wellness policy is required to include nutrition guidelines for all foods and beverages available on campus. And that includes foods that are shared or provided at no charge, for things like classroom celebrations and snacks and family events, that type of thing. But the district can set these guidelines, and they don't have to be consistent with smart snacks, which only apply to foods that are sold. So it's a good idea to take a look at your district policy, see you know, what it says about uh, these types of activities, and see if the policy meets or goes beyond the smart snack standards. If, if it doesn't, uh, this is something that you can advocate for as a school health champion. So new guidelines for district policies were just finalized this summer as well. And districts have until June 30th of uh, 2017 to get their policies updated. So a note that the third bullet on the screen, uh, that there's a new restriction on food and beverage marketing. Only foods and beverages that meet the federal standards can be marketed. So. Um, be great not to see quite so many things advertised around schools that um, are outside of those standards. So now I am going to turn it over to Michelle, if I can get her unmuted. And she's going to talk about some best practices and specific ways you can make your school food culture healthier. Uh, go ahead and take it away, Michelle. Thanks, Carol. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about specific ways that you can uh, make your food school food culture healthier uh, by start a little bit talking about fundraising. If you're selling food items for immediate consumption during the school day, just like Carol mentioned earlier, or afterwards at events, how can you make them healthier? Even if they meet the smart snack standards, there's still a lot of variation in terms of what foods are more nutritious than others. And since concessions don't even fall under these guidelines, you really need to use encouragement and advocacy to make sure that you get the changes made in those areas. Find out who's responsible in the area you'd like to see changes made and approaching them in a friendly professional manner. Regardless of whether the items are covered by Smart Snacks, you can use the regulations as a platform to advocate for healthier options and you can use your district wellness policy. Find vendors that offer healthier options. Encourage them to price healthier items less expensively than, than the unhealthier items. A couple of studies have found that lowering the price of fruits, vegetables, and low-fat snacks resulted in a significant increase in the sale of these foods without decreasing total revenue. Marketing those healthier options is also a great idea. Offer taste tests to help with that. Sometimes you can find grants or community partners to help with the cost. There is a concern that schools will lose revenue if they switch to healthier foods in their vending machines and other competitive food venues. Studies have shown that while some schools report an initial decrease in revenue, there's a, a great deal of evidence suggesting that schools can have strong nutrition, strong nutrition standards and maintain financial stability. Some schools end up making more money and increasing sale of school meals, which makes up for any losses they may have had through a la carte or vending sales. The second study mentioned on this slide uh, by the Illinois Public Health Institute, controlling junk food and the bottom line, has some good strategies for maintaining profits. While profits were certainly a concern, a majority of principals, food service directors, and other school leaders surveyed in that study also felt that doing the right thing was more important than profits anyway. Most reported that competitive food profits were rebounding substantially within two years. Of course, there are many fundraising activities that don't involve selling food for immediate consumption at school, and they don't fall under the Smart Snack Guideline, things like chocolate bars and cookie dough. Unfortunately, it's really easy to make money selling unhealthy things, but the good news is there are more and more companies out there that offer non-food or healthy food fundraising options, and it's becoming clear that they can generate profits for school equal to or even greater than the profits from fundraisers selling low nutrition foods. Look at the examples on this table. Spiritwear, a walkathon, a grocery store script program. These are all great fundraisers that don't require selling unhealthy items. Action for Healthy Kids has ideas for fundraisers that involve healthy foods and those that don't involve food at all. 
So you can find these and lots of fundraising ideas that promote healthy lifestyles on our website. We're going to share our tip sheets and resources with you in a follow-up email. Note that when you are trying to put on a healthy fundraiser, you need to look for coupon books, script programs, and auction items that promote health-conscious businesses and services. Active fundraisers are one of the best ways to go. Runs or tournaments, uh, teacher-student competitions are popular. I know our PTAs in Texas, have a lot of them have turned to fund runs. And even in smaller towns and smaller districts, they've made in a thirty thousand dollars on a fund run, and that's you know pretty much a hundred percent profit. You may have you have a few expenses as opposed to giving back half or more of your profit when you sell candy bars. Note that when you're trying to put on a healthy fundraiser, you need to look. Well, we already did that slide. <laughs> Action for Healthy Kids has a new fundraising initiative that works for your school and is fun, healthy, and educational for students. This is brand new, the Superfit School Challenge. It's a partnership between your school and Action for Healthy Kids. It includes a healthy eating and physical activity component, a comprehensive toolkit for fundraising and equipment and resources for conducting the fun, healthy, and interactive final event, the Superfit School Obstacle Course. You can find out more about the Superfit School Challenge at superfitschoolchallenge.org. And then you can talk to our social enterprise director, Pam Soto, if you have questions. We're going to include these links in our follow-up email as well. So now let's talk a little bit about healthy birthdays and celebrations. Those are great ways for children to feel part of a school community where the learning environment is made festive and where kids, teachers, and parents can come together and enjoy a break from the routine. Traditionally, school parties often centered on food, such as cupcakes, cookies, candy, chips, and beverages, like punch or maybe a Capri Sun. These foods in moderation are fine as part of a healthy, well-balanced diet, but these unhealthy choices have almost become a daily norm in the classroom rather than an exception. So let's talk about some different ideas and ways that you can make celebrations healthier. For birthdays, there are lots of things you can do to make a birthday child feel special without serving unhealthy treats. Being the teacher's helper makes most, a lot of kids feel really special. And having special activity time with an adult are good ideas. Let the birthday child choose a game or activity for the class. If parents want to bring something for their kid's birthday, ask them to donate a favorite book to the classroom library instead of bringing treats. If that's not economically feasible for the families, have the birthday child pick a book from the classroom library for the teacher to read to the class. You can ask your individual teachers to establish birthday guidelines, or you can have your school principal work on guidelines and, and get with your PTA or your campus um, site-based council to talk about what they'd like to see. Then see if the uh, switching for maybe to a monthly party would help cut down on unhealthy food in the classroom, or just making minor modifications. For instance, in middle school, they have dances. Instead of having sodas for the entire dance, make it a policy to have sodas for half the dance and water for half the dance. It doesn't have to be totally restrictive, but you do need to look at the, how you can improve the, the celebrations and different events. For holiday parties and other celebrations, you could possibly give the, the, the students extra recess time instead of a party. Or you can have a dance party and invite the principal and the other school staff. Get students involved in planning and preparation for these celebrations and let them make the decorations and favors and choose the games. Organize a special community service project instead of a party. Kids like adventure, so you know, don't be afraid to try something new. Think a little bit outside the box. Action for Healthy Kids Game On program has lots of tips, healthy party ideas, and healthy recipes in the Game On on our website. So let's talk a little bit about family events. Planning family events to get parents engaged and on board with healthy living, as this will create more buy-in and support for a healthy school food culture. It also makes it more likely that healthy habits will be reinforced at home. How about a watermelon welcome at the beginning of the school year? Health fairs are always popular, but you don't have to stop there. How about offering cooking lessons or Iron Chef competitions? I know in Texas we work with our AgriLife Extension, which is the county extension folks, uh, and partner with them on providing nutrition classes. 
I know that also the food bank sometimes will work with you on uh, healthy classes for, for families. Or maybe a 30-day challenge where you pick a healthy habit and organize a competition around it. Start with a kickoff event and end with a celebration. Getting your families to walk the track is a great, easy way to get them engaged. When food is part of a celebration or event, make health the exception, expectation, and the easy choice for students and family. You can offer a variety of healthy options, including fruits and vegetables, low-fat, fat-free dairy products, and water. Promote fruits and vegetables by arranging them in visually appealing ways. There's a lot of great ideas you'll find on Pinterest. Um, offer sweets in small portion sizes with other healthier foods that balance out the meal. In fact, one of the good ideas that we've used is trying just cutting them in half, um, making, taking what may be considered a standard portion and, and cutting it in smaller pieces. Make sign-up sheets that list items like fruits, vegetables, whole grain crackers, low-fat or fat-free yogurt, cheese, milk, and water, and then include one line for a parent to bring a less nutritious, more traditional party treat, which is an opportunity to teach moderation. Alternatively, instead of sign-up sheets, you could send home a list of suggestions for healthy party snacks. It's really important these days to pay attention to food allergies and special diet needs. Working with your parents to create a list of food allergies for all students to be distributed at the beginning of the year to specify what food to bring for celebrations is really important. Some districts now have policies that all food brought from home must be prepackaged to help ensure food safety and so that all ingredients are listed for kids in that with allergies. However, sometimes it's hard to find prepackaged foods that kids with allergies can eat. Uh, whole foods are sometimes considered something to be prepackaged, so that's a good thing. If your parents are the creative type, um, how about edible food art? As I mentioned earlier, you can find all kinds of ideas on Pinterest that fit in with any different holiday. <clears throat> Rewards are an integral part of your school's culture. Teachers, administrators, and parent groups offer rewards to recognize and celebrate student accomplishments. Food rewards are typically high in fat, added sugars, and sodium with little nutritional value. A lot of times uh, pizza parties are a big thing for our schools. And these rewards are adding a lot of times entry cal empty calories to their diets on top of their everyday meals. And of course, they contradict classroom lessons on nutrition. School health organizations and other child children's health experts like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians recommend non-food rewards as best practice. Providing any kind of food based on performance or behavior is teaching kids to eat when they're not hungry, setting the stage for unhealthy habits that can last a lifetime. I know it, it's difficult even for me. You do something special, you want to go out and celebrate by having ice cream. Um, it's, it's, you know, we always do birthday cakes for uh, birthdays. So the more we continue to reinforce that habit of, of uh, rewarding ourselves with food, the harder and harder it is to get out of it. So, and you're setting the stage for habits that will contribute to childhood obesity. You can always advocate for healthy rewards with individual teachers on a personal level. On the screen, you'll see some ideas for starting a school-wide healthy rewards initiative. Give a presentation about healthy rewards at a staff meeting and then ask teachers to take a no food as reward pledge. Then you could recognize the teachers who follow through on that pledge. Uh, PTA or PTO sponsored guidelines could be created around healthy rewards and you can provide prizes for the teachers who use donations or uh, use PTA or PTO funds. Recognition in and of itself is a very powerful reward. Consider recognizing students during morning announcements or at a school assembly or a photo recognition board on the, or something on the school's website. Most kids enjoy hearing their successes and acknowledged in front of their peers. Don't underestimate the power of small personalized efforts such as a phone call or an email to a student's parents, a handwritten note, or a certificate of achievement. Non-material rewards involving privileges and opportunities for physical activity or other types of enrichment are powerful ways to promote healthy living. School supplies, Trinkets and toys and gift certificates can be donated by parents or provided by parent-teacher organizations for use on a more limited basis. 
the trinkets don't really work well for the older kids, but you can still be creative and find plenty of ways things that would be of interest to them. Extra credit has always been a favorite one. Make sure rewards organized by your parent-teacher organization send a consistent health message as well. Look at this typical PTO calendar. What message does this send? Try to avoid rewards centered around unhealthy eating like a pancake party on the slide or fast food restaurant coupons. So let's talk a little bit about healthy snacks and access to drinking water. Many kids bring snacks to school and sometimes school programs, school staff or other parents provide snacks for students to share. Children need snacks to keep their bodies and minds going and as much as 30% of daily kids' daily calories can come from those snacks. If they're eating processed grain-based snack food, like many of the popular options available, two-thirds of those calories may be coming from added sugar. Eating well-balanced, nutrient-rich snacks throughout the school day can help ensure that kids don't get hungry between meals, which can lead to overeating and when mealtimes arrive. Making school snacks as nutritious as possible is important for student performance and the development of healthy eating habits. We recommend three strategies for healthy snacks. First strategy, model healthy snacking is one thing you can do. Why not ask teachers to make a point of eating healthy snacks and drinking healthy beverages in front of the kids? Encourage them to talk to kids about how they feel better, stronger, and smarter when eating this way. The same goes for parent volunteers working at the school. See if the school can put a big fruit bowl instead of candy in the front office, available for staff, students, and parents to help themselves. Brainstorm ways to keep it full, maybe donations from your local grocery store, PTO funds, have families bring in donations. This small effort can send a really strong message to anyone entering the office that this is a school that values healthy eating. Strategy number two is to promote healthy snacking. There are many ways to do this from hanging up colorful posters around these themes and promoting them in your newsletter, on your website, and on flyers you send home. There's a variety of material available for promoting these messages. A lot can come from USDA's MyPlate uh, website. You can use their icon, which is recognized in their messaging. You can promote eating a rainbow message, which encourages eating natural foods that come in a variety of colors. Uh, the Go Slow, Eat Woe, Slogan, go foods being those that you can eat anytime, slow foods that those that should be eaten less often, and woe well foods should be eaten only once in a while or on special occasions. Getting your cafeteria to use these type of, of uh, markers in the, in the cafeteria line is even helpful. In addition to messaging, see if you can conduct periodic taste tests on healthy snack items in the classroom, in the cafeteria, or elsewhere. Children try something and like it, and then they're going to be more likely to ask their parents if they can have it at home. Volunteer to make a classroom chart that tracks when kids bring fresh fruits and vegetables for a snack. Consider offering a non-food reward when students reach certain milestones. Uh, elementary schools love stickers. Rewarding kids with a sticker when they eat healthy is, is just a simple, easy way of promoting eating healthy. Depends on your, <coughs> excuse me, depending on your school population, be sure to be sensitive if you take this approach, as some families may or not be able to afford daily fresh fruits and vegetables. Come up with ideas for promoting healthy snacks as part of your initiative. Some families might be willing to provide extra snacks for kids who can't bring them. Perhaps the PTA or PTO has funds they'd be willing to contribute. Don't hesitate to seek community partners and funding opportunities that could help your school provide healthy snacks. For example, perhaps the school can partner with a local grocery store that would be willing to donate fruits and vegetables. If your school has a high free and reduced lunch population, it may be easier to set, these up, set up these different types of partnerships. Access to drinking water. Schools that participate in National School Meal Program are required to make free water available to students during mealtimes, and schools should use a variety of strategies to ensure that students have access to free drinking water throughout the school day. Ensuring that water fountain and dispensers are accessible, clean, and properly maintained. Allowing students to have water bottles in class or to go to the water fountain if they need a drink of water. One of the things our PTAs purchased, uh, things that go on top of existing water fountains that turn them into water filling stations 
And then they did a contest and, and gave away water bottles to all the students. So there's a lot of different ways you can encourage drinking water. Just be sure and advocate for these if they're not already being followed. And make sure that your, your school does have working water fountains. Nutrition education and promotion can take place across the school, formally and informally, inside and outside of the classroom, in the cafeteria, all around the school, and at school events. Everything involved that we've talked about already is, is part and parcel of nutrition education. Parents can play a very important role in promotion of nutrition at school by coordinating school committees, student committees, hosting assemblies, doing workshops and family events around nutrition, and promoting nutrition through signage, newsletters, and taste tests. School gardens are a particularly powerful teaching tool. It's really valuable for children to gain hands-on experience learning about real healthy food. Plus, kids are often more willing to try new foods when they grow the food themselves. Integrating school garden curriculum into classroom activities and young farmers markets makes school gardening even more educational and sustainable. I know in Austin that our district recommends that each school from elementary through high school have a school garden. Many of our schools provide um, fruits and vegetables for the cafeteria. Um, some of them have their own farmers markets. Many of them send food home on the weekends with families. So uh, school gardens can be incredible teaching tools. Farm to school is about establishing relationships between local farmer and school children with the objectives of improving student nutrition, providing agriculture, health, and nutrition education opportunities, and supporting local and regional farmers. Our uh, Department of Agriculture in Texas have declared Fridays Farm Fresh Fridays and encourage all schools to, to purchase local fresh fruits and vegetables from local farmers um, for Fridays specifically so that it's and it eventually hopefully incorporate more and more farm to school. So now I'm going to turn this back to Carol and I think she's going to talk about sustainability. Carol? Yes, thank you so much Michelle. Lots of wonderful ideas. We really appreciate it. Uh, so let's talk about sustainability and then I would like to share some Action for Healthy Kids resources before we turn it over to our guest uh, speaker Robin. All right, so uh, when we implement school wellness initiatives, we really are trying to create lasting lifestyle changes, uh, not one-off projects that, that definitely might have some short-term value, but they don't, they don't last, they don't have a lasting impact. And this is really important when you consider all the time that your team is putting in, both volunteers and staff. It's also important when you're trying to find funding for your projects. Funders don't want to invest in short-term impacts. So as Healthy School Champions, we should really be considering our own investment of time and resources in that same way. So include sustainability measures in your action plan when you're starting one of these initiatives. Implement projects that provide ongoing opportunities for kids to eat right and be active. Community involvement is also really important. In fact, it's critical. Promote your initiatives and communicate your progress to the community in a variety of ways. Uh, and implementing projects isn't enough. Uh, you need to incorporate those best practices into school policies and guidelines. Uh, and you can also think about integrating health and wellness into your school improvement plan. So you can use uh, a program like Game On, as we've talked about uh, before. It can really help you with sustainability because it, it, it creates an ongoing framework for all of your wellness activities and can be engaging for your students. Now, one of GameOn's goals is to help your school meet the criteria to get recognized as a health-promoting school through the USDA's Healthier U.S. School Challenge Smarter Lunchroom Certification Program. The process of evaluating your school's overall wellness environment, including all of those school food culture activities that we've shared, uh, that process can often serve as a catalyst for new initiatives. And then the recognition that you'll receive uh, when you get certified that helps to create a wellness identity for your school. So check out the Healthier U.S. School Challenge. Uh, check out Game On, which can kind of direct you there. Action for Healthy Kids also has um, uh, can very possibly uh, provide support for you uh, as far as getting certified. Uh, check on our website and look um, at the state coordinator in your state and um, if you're interested in learning more about that. Now there might be other uh, recognition programs in your state or region as well. Uh, sometimes they come with financial incentives, so uh, they're worth checking out too. 
also wanted to point out our Wellness Wednesday webinar series, uh, which takes place the second Wednesday of each month. Of each of these is a short 30-minute webinar, and it showcases the best practice from our Game On program. And uh, all of these webinars are recorded, so if you missed any of them or uh, can't attend the live session, uh, you can go back and listen to them later at your convenience. And uh, I want to talk about Every Kid Healthy Week. Uh, Every Kid Healthy Week is a national annual celebration of school's wellness achievements, and it takes place the last week of April each year. Uh, schools are invited to host an event during Every Kid Healthy Week or at any time in April. It doesn't have to be during that last week. Um, you consider making your field day or other school-wide event health-focused, or you can create a new event to celebrate. Uh, the goal of Every Kid Healthy Week is to create nationwide momentum around school wellness. And last year, we had more than 1,600 schools across the country host Every Kid Healthy events. Now, to be a part of that national movement, uh, we recommend you register your event on our site. That helps to bring momentum, and it gets your school on the Every Kid Healthy map. Now, uh, it's my pleasure, and I better unmute her. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Robin Johnson. Robin is a member of Colorado Action for Healthy Kids Parent Advisory Board. Uh, she's a parent at Marshdale Elementary in Evergreen, Colorado. And uh, Robin founded Marshdale's Health and Wellness Committee in 2014. Uh, she mobilized school staff, parents, students, and community partners to create and implement a comprehensive action plan to make their school healthier. Uh, on the screen, you can see a sample of the initiatives that she helped launch. Uh, her influence, though, extends beyond Marshdale. Her ideas have been adopted by several schools in her mountain community. And uh, for that reason, she won a Healthy School Hero Award from Colorado Action for Healthy Kids last year. Uh, professionally, Robin is a holistic health coach and nutrition educator. She teaches exploring foods together to preschoolers and after-school cooking classes to second through fifth graders. And um, Robin, don't have time for Robin to talk about all of her initiatives, but she's going to talk a, a little bit about Rainbow Week and her Healthy Role Models Project. So uh, welcome, Robin. Take it away. Thank you so much, Carol, for having me here and for letting me share what um, our Health and Wellness committees, or Committee has done um, in the past couple years. So. Um, Starting with Rainbow Week, we came up with the idea um, about two years ago, and I'm a huge fan of St. Patrick's Day, and so I thought the idea of um, having a rainbow would fit in really good with the holiday since we talk about the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Um, we were looking for a low-cost product project that would basically raise awareness around better nutrition and more specifically, eating all the different colors of the rainbow every day. Um, so we sent home a flyer encouraging parents to send the colors of the rainbow for snacks and um, or lunches. And for example, they would send a red fruit or vegetable on Monday, an orange fruit or vegetable on Tuesday, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, green would be on St. Patrick's Day, whatever day that, that would fall on. Um, we uh, received some feedback that everything was good and parents said their kids would remind them to make sure um, to pack the right color of fruit or veggies because they didn't want to be the one that didn't have the right color. <laughs> so, um, so we got that feedback and we also received feedback that um, the kids in the classroom where they would have their snacks would compare what each other brought so they were looking to see what other um, kids were having as their red fruit or veggie. Um, uh, you can see on the, the slide here that we sent home a tracking sheet with the kids so they could keep track of their rainbow every day. And then um, we suggested that the parents um, sort of set a surprise for the end of the week, a non-food reward um, to their kids that would uh, do the the rainbow every day of the week. Um, there weren't any prizes. We did not do any follow-up. Um, it was strictly for fun and to um, raise awareness around eating, um, eating the rainbow. 
Um, so last year we had a family cooking night as the kickoff to Rainbow Week, and we made rainbow fajitas. We had a total of about 23 people at the cooking night, which was basically our maximum. Um, and this year we plan to make it a little bigger than we have in the past. And we're going to send out our nutrition fitness bingo cards. Um, and the yeah, so there's the slide that shows the bingo cards. And um, it sort of encourages physical activity and good nutrition. It's blackout bingo, so all the students have to cross off each square on the card. We did this as a separate project a few years ago. And um, once they filled out the same or all of the um, boxes, they brought back the card, and they received a jump rope, jump rope as a prize. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to do prizes this year for the cards. We're still kind of working that out. Um, for Rainbow Week this year, we're also planning on having fruit-infused water in the hallway. Um, you can see a picture of the fruit-infused water that we used at a different event at our Mustang Trot that we do for our big fundraiser at the beginning of the year um, on the picture on the slide there. And so we'll have those in the hallway for students to fill their water bottle with different fruit-infused water. And then um, planning on doing some more, you know, some rainbow decorations throughout the hallways and then sending some more parent education support, like flyers that will list fruits and vegetables of different colors. Um, and then we'll send home the tracking sheet again, um, like we did last year. So that's what we're doing for Rainbow Week and what we've done in the past. And um, another low-cost project that we did to raise awareness around health and wellness was our Healthy Role Models Project. We sent out a questionnaire to the teachers and staff asking them like three simple questions. Number one was, what's your favorite way to exercise? Number two was, what's your favorite healthy food? And number three was, what's your favorite way to relax? And then we made posters with each of the teachers' responses. Um, and some of the teachers included pictures of them being active or outside or reading a book or whatever. And then we hung them on a display in the hallway. And that way, parents and students and even other teachers could read them and sort of get inspired to try some new foods or try a different activity. Um, it was a really easy and low-cost way to spotlight taking care of your body by eating healthy food, exercising, and managing stress. So those are a couple of the projects that we've done at our school. Carol, do you have anything else? Did I miss anything? Um, or? <laughs> no, I um, thank you so much, Robin. We are going to go into uh, question time, and I'm pulling up our questions to see what we have, and I bet there will be some for you as well. Okay. So let's take a look and see. Um, okay, here's one for you, Robin. Does your cooking night involve parents and students cooking in the school kitchen? I'm interested in the logistics of an event like this. Right. So family cooking night we um, is, is uh, in collaboration with our Mountain Resource Center. And they have brought in, they bring in um, like the, the hot plates and different uh, griddles that we can plug in. So we aren't actually using the kitchen. Um, we set it up in the cafeteria, and we send out uh, like a Sign Up Genius link for parents to sign up, and the whole family, or mom, just mom and one of the kids, or mom and all of the kids, or the whole family comes, and we all, um, you know, chop and cook, and sometimes there's different stations um, to experience, you know whoever wants to cook or whoever wants to chop or whatever. So, OK, here's another one. Um, are all of those wonderful slides of the rainbow and bingo available to us? And yes, Robin has agreed to share those. So we will send out links to those um, in the follow-up uh, follow email after the webinar. 
So um, let's see. Here's another one for you, Robin. I knew there would be a lot for you because you're doing so many different <laughs> incredible things. Um, so somebody noticed that you, um, on the intro slide, that you had done a no candy as reward policy. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit and, and in particular talk about um, how it, how successful it was in implementing it, how it goes over, you know, how it went over with the school? So um, that happened right off the bat. Our principal was um, really supportive with health and wellness committee initiatives. And we brought that up, and he talked to the he sent out an email to all the teachers saying that um, he didn't, you know, we were going to go to no candy rewards. And um, I think it works in some classrooms, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't work in all of the classrooms. <laughs> so um, it's it's kind of um, maybe still growing and changing. <laughs> Well, that's, um, I think one has to look at the progress, like you said, you know, it's, right. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, you know, uh, if you've moved the needle on that, then, um, you know, you've, you, you are being successful. And like you said, it, it, you have to be patient. It takes a long time. Not everybody uh, immediately comes around to any initiative that you do and any policy initiative either. So. Um, feeling good about the changes that have taken place, you know, is really important in celebrating those, I think. Right. Yeah, definitely. And just, you know, um, taking baby steps, too, is, you know, really important, I think, because you can't mm -hmm. just, you know, jam it down people's throats, you know, <laughs> so. Right. That's a really, really good point that um, I don't know if we, we really made, that we, that we try to make when we're talking. We, in Colorado, we work with a lot of parents and parent groups. And the healthy school food culture is really, really important to them. That the, seems to be the, the main thing that they are very passionate about. And that's when we said earlier about you know, have to be sensitive to different people's needs and different people's cultures when you're trying to make changes in that area. But uh, one thing we always say is uh, take those small steps. Figure out something that you can win easily. You know, if you go and you try to um, for example, if the first thing you do is to implement a policy, you know, that, that is no candy and, and you haven't done anything else to lay the groundwork for that or to get, um, to get people in the school knowing who you are, what your committee's doing, the purpose, if you haven't done, laid that groundwork first um, by doing small things that will give you wins, it's a lot, it's going to be a lot harder to get something major implemented. Absolutely. So. Yep. Mm-hmm. And here's a question for you kind of related to that. So um, I guess uh, uh, an audience member says, I just started a wellness committee at my school. Hard to gain traction, though. How did you get parents interested in joining the committee? Um, little by little, um, one of the things that we did was um, at the beginning of the year, we do an ice cream social, which I'm hoping will change to a watermelon welcome next year. But um, at the ice cream social, different uh, organizations have tables set up in the gym, um, like Boy Scouts and softball and different activities for the kids. And so we set up a health and wellness booth and just started talking to people and handing out flyers that um, you know they could volunteer with us if they wanted to. And then we had a sign up. Um, that they could put their email on and be, you know, um, involved in our email list. So, and that's gradually grown through the years. Um, there happens to be like a core group of people that form our committee, and then um, everyone, you know, and then there's like 25 on the list that volunteer sometimes. <laughs> Great. You know, I'm going to unmute Michelle again, too, because she's got so much experience in this area. Um, if you have anything to add to any of these questions, Michelle, just jump right in, if she's still there. Um, so I also just want to point out that if you are just starting a committee, uh, look around and see there, there may be other initiatives going on that parents are involved in that they don't 
you know, that they're not even really thinking, that they're doing an isolation that they're not even thinking of as being part of a greater committee. Uh, you know, there might be somebody doing something related to a running club or leading an after-school yoga class. Uh, there might be parents that are working on uh, healthy classroom parties in a different grade level than yours and uh, that, that may not even be thinking about starting a committee. But if you can find these individuals that are, that are committed and uh, start working together, you can put it to them that really everybody's initiative will have more power if you're working together under, under an umbrella like your wellness committee or using a program like Game On, something like that. Mm -hmm. And one of the things so, that also, can I, can I add one yeah, more? Go ahead. Bit? Sure. Um, sure. One of the things that also helped when I started um, my committee was that I met with the president of our PTA and got her on board first. And she was actually um, part of the health and wellness committee as well. So that helps a lot too. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see. Um, here's a good question for anyone. Uh, how do you motivate private schools to create a healthy school food culture when there are no state or federal mandates? So I will speak to that uh, a little bit, and then anybody else can add. Uh, so if the private school is not participating in the national school meal programs, then, then they don't have uh, those, then they are not under the Smart Snacks regulations. And so that means that one has to go back to those old advocacy and encouragement skills and uh, talk about, uh, talk to your school leaders, talk to your school board if you have one, uh, talk to other parents and find as many parents as you possibly can to um, um, advocate with you because there's definitely power when you're in a group. And, and go back to those things we talked about in the beginning and how um, you know, the, the, the link, certainly the learning connection, the link between physical activity, nutrition, and learning. I mean, your school, the, the goal of your school, your school's mission is going to be to uh, get student performance up to be, you know, the maximum that it possibly can be and to have students reach their full potential. Uh, these uh, healthy school food culture directly impacts that. And so uh, look at some of those tools that you can find to share with your school leaders. And um, like I said, I'm, I, it's likely there are other parents. Uh, you may not know them, but it's likely there are other parents that feel the same way you do. So if you can uh, find them, um, that's a start. And also, you can look outside of your school and look at community resources, community partners. There are nonprofits like Action for Healthy Kids. There may be some in your area that are also working on this, your health department, your um, your Department of Education, Office of School Nutrition, uh, all can be able to tell you about programs that might be happening in your area. Anybody else, uh, Robin or Michelle, have anything to add to that? Well, sometimes if you, you know, you can do like a parent survey if the school will let you send out a link and ask the parents, you know, what are their major concerns around school nutrition or around physical activity in the school, and then ask them if they'd be interested in working on and then do a list of a school garden or a fun run or a taste testing opportunity and give them some options and then also if you can let them know you know these are not time intensive things um, parents are more and more busy in just identifying ways that they can participate or letting them know that you're not asking them to volunteer to do something that's going to take 50 hours um, and you'll, you know, but that you are interested in doing something that would improve the the school nutrition environment. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you, Michelle and Robin. Thank you both so much for joining us and for your expertise. Uh, a couple more quick things that I just wanted to point out uh, that were questions. Uh, somebody asked if we if all district wellness policies must be completed by June. Uh, that's yes, they all must be updated to incorporate the new rules that were finalized uh, last summer. That all has to happen by this June. I mean, and if your policy already has all of those rules in it, then nothing would need to change, but uh, they just all have to be compliant with the new rules by the end of June. And then will we get the slides post-session? Uh, we don't actually send out the slides, but we do send out lots of handouts and tip sheets in all of these areas, and any of the resources that we mention or links that we provided will also be in the follow-up email. So that said, um, I want to thank you all very much. I want to direct you to 
our uh, website. We have lots of social media channels and lots of places uh, where you can get tons of ideas on all of these topics. Uh, so um, that concludes the webinar today. Uh, we'll send out the follow-up email in two to three days. And um, really like to thank uh, not just Michelle and Robin again, but also all of our listeners for all of the things that you're doing every day to ensure that all kids in your school community are healthy, active, and ready to learn. Again, thank you so much, and I hope the rest of your day is great.